How did you and Arts and Exhibitions International become involved with this particular exhibition? Well, you know, uh, King Tut, when it toured in the 70s, it really defined what a blockbuster exhibition was then and was to be. And uh, those two words were never really used together, blockbuster and exhibition. But that exhibition that toured in the 70s, it really became part of pop culture, didn't it? It was Steve Martin on Saturday Night Live. It was affecting fashion and architecture. And it was people lined up around the block. And it really was that once in a lifetime never to return to the United States again. But when we kind of got word, a little bit of a, uh, a signal out of Egypt that maybe there was a chance the exhibition would travel again, the treasures of Tutankhamun would be allowed outside of Egypt, we of course got in line and really wanted to have our, our time in front of the Supreme Council of Antiquities and make our pitch why, we'd, why we would be a good partner. Well, many years later, of course, here we are. Uh, things worked out very well. It's been an amazing privilege to be part of this experience, to tour the exhibition, first of all around the world, and to bring back, uh, I think for the final time, the treasures of Tutankhamun. Uh, after all, they are building, the Egyptians are building, the largest museum in the world, the Grand Egyptian Museum, and that most likely will be the permanent home for the Tutankhamun artifacts. So um, uh, it's a privilege, obviously, to be part of this. Uh, we had our negotiations now many years ago, back in, I'd say, 2003, 2004, uh, that has really brought us to this moment. What do you think the biggest challenge you and your team faced when designing an exhibition that is traveling to multiple locations? Well, you do have to keep that in mind. Uh, the artifacts are the same, the storyline is the same, the theatrical touches, the graphics, but it's always a little different look. That's always fun, of course, because one city to the next to the next, you've got something to look forward to. It's not just the same cookie-cutter exhibition. Uh, the other challenge is the theatrical elements of this show. Uh, I was on the radio this afternoon and we were talking one of the uh, host was saying how much he enjoyed kind of walking through the exhibition and appreciate it, for lack of a better word, the theatrical touches. Well, uh, exhibitions have changed over the years, and if you look at that exhibition in the 70s, the artifacts, and there were only 50 from Tutankhamun's tomb, were beautiful, were fantastic, were the focus of the show as they are in this show, but I think now we're, we have a little bit more latitude to provide context and backdrops to these artifacts. You know, if I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times, uh, people will say, you know, I will never make it to Egypt. Today is my visit to Egypt as they walk through. So to give a little bit of that context, I think is important, but always remembering that these pieces of history are the real focus uh, of this exhibition, uh, certainly as you walk through and discover gallery to gallery. Speaking of the guest experience, yeah. Douglas Britt from the Houston Chronicle recently wrote, um, I can't remember visiting a blockbuster exhibit that flowed so smoothly or lent itself so readily to a self-guided tour. What are some of the design elements and details that allow for such a smooth guest experience? Well, that's good to hear because uh, we do put a lot of emphasis on that experience. That should be nothing that the uh, that the guest necessarily notices, but the time that the, by the time he or she is outside of the exhibition, says, you know what, I enjoyed that. Not only did I enjoy seeing the pieces, the artifacts, but I enjoyed whatever trip I was just on. Uh, there are some small things that uh, have become quite important. You'll notice when you walk through the exhibition, all the labels are not only down low near the artifacts themselves, but also a pie. So you can stand two or three people deep um, uh, behind, behind people looking at an artifact, read the label, look at the piece, and be able to move on with, without having to wait your turn. And then I, I hope there's a flow, there's a, uh, an ebb and a flow to this exhibition. The first part of the exhibition features 80 artifacts uh, from over 2,000 years of ancient Egyptian history. We're really looking at two exhibitions in one. And each gallery, each space, uh, I hope there's a new discovery. You turn a corner and now you're faced with another object or another story. And then when you finally get into the four galleries that represent the four rooms of the tomb, the antechamber, the annex, the treasury, and the burial chamber. These were names given by Howard Carter to the rooms of the tomb. I really hope you feel a difference. Uh, we've lowered the ceiling or the representative ceiling in the space here a little bit. It becomes a little more intimate, uh, a little more tomb-like without being realistic. So I hope you feel that excitement. Remember Howard Carter, when he broke through that wall, his uh, uh, financier, Lord Carnarvon, he said, 
do you see anything? And Howard Carter stuck that uh, candle inside the hole and he said, yes, wonderful things. Well, those wonderful things are here in Houston now and I hope you have that sense of discovery. I know you'll have that sense of awe when you see these objects. And you put it, sense of awe, um, leads right into my next question, which is most guests do experience a sense of awe the first time they see these objects. What is the most unexpected guest reaction that you've heard? Boy, good question. You know, so many people come with different backgrounds and, and quite frankly, a different uh, uh, expectation. The expectation is always high, of course, because it is the King Tut exhibit. It is coming back to the U.S. maybe for the last time. So I think expectations are high, so you have to meet that. Um, I think what I, and, and maybe not directly to your question, but what I'm always quite delighted to see is usually uh, you'll see three generations of people enjoying the exhibition in the same way, whether it's grandparents, parents, or children. And I think there's something here to connect to, to everyone. Uh, I've been delighted to see young people, uh, those children, connect to the exhibition. Uh, they're fascinated always with, we all are, with ancient Egypt. But remember, this was the boy king. This was a nine-year-old king. And when you walk into the gallery and see, for instance, that, that small little throne, that chair that he sat on, or the game that he played as a child, the, the intricate detail of the workmanship, but still it's a kid's game, there's that ability to connect. So we don't really know too much about King Tut, Tutankhamun. He may have gotten lost in the pages of history if it wasn't for this amazing discovery in 1922 by Howard Carter. Uh, remember, uh, it's the most intact tomb ever discovered. That's why we talk about it today. So I, I'm not sure I'm surprised with uh, what people say, but I'm always delighted that the interest is there, the enthusiasm is there, and when people walk out the other side, there's a great deal of energy to learn more, and uh, I hope to visit Egypt, because as we know, Egypt's going through some, uh, some changing times, some very beautiful, wonderful times, but there's some challenges there. But recently have been there, it's a safe place to visit, and it's like no place on Earth. So this exhibition brings Egypt to Houston, but I hope Houston gets to go to Egypt in the future, too. What do you think is most unique about the Houston space? Well, uh, I like how expansive it is. Um, you know, many times you'll have a space that, that moves uh, this way and then turns this way and turns this way. This really was a blank canvas, and it, it's been a delight to install it here. I also like the way the exhibition, quite frankly, it might be a little detail, but looks from the outside. When you stand below this, uh, this level, and a lot of the evening events are down on that level uh, below us, and look up, uh, it, it's a nice uh, full view, if you will, not seeing inside, but seeing this exterior wall with some of the graphics and the colors, we've never had that. Usually it's kind of that entry in a portal and then you've, you've, you, you get lost behind that wall. Here you kind of get that sense of, wow, this is going to be, this is going to be great. Uh, one thing we're doing here that we haven't done at every stop, uh, recently we've, we've uh, uh, added a gallery that talks about the science of the study of Tutankhamun's mummy. And uh, we're all fascinated with mummies, with mummification. Uh, and recent work on Tutankhamun's mummy, uh, DNA testing uh, is most recent. Before that, CT scans. We're learning more and more about how he lived, maybe how he died, and also his family tree. It wasn't until the DNA test results were recently released that we knew for sure, as a, for instance, that Akhenaten was Tutankhamun's father. So we're learning these things every day. And what we have in that last gallery, not the mummy of Tutankhamun, because that st not only doesn't it, not only does it uh, uh, stay in Egypt, it also has never left the Valley of the Kings and only left the tomb uh, four times. But we have an exact replica. And when I say exact, I mean exact, because it was the CT scan information. Uh, that provided us this ability to kind of uh, cut the, out, of, out of a piece of acrylic underwater, uh, um, uh, flashes of light from the lasers that were making the cut. Very interesting way it was put together, but there you are standing in front of this, um, this replica of the mummy. And, uh, you know, people have come up to me and, said, uh, and have said, I think I saw the mummy when, it, when the exhibition toured in the 70s, or in the 60s when it was, there was an exhibition here in Houston, and it really has never left Egypt. So I think this is the next best thing. I remember Dr. Zahi Hawass was not going to allow this replica in the exhibition before he saw it. And I remember when he walked in for the first time, it was quite quiet, and I stepped back, and he looked from the, from the head down to the toes, and he looked at the head again, toes, and he looked at me and he said, 
I cannot tell the difference. And he just walked off in a very dramatic way. I said, that's a good thing, you know. So it's really something, uh, a, a bonus gallery, if you will, in the exhibition. Do you ever worry about a curse? Well, you know, you hear about the curse a lot, of course, right? And when we had the exhibition in London, I went to the London Times and they had the uh, photographic rights, the publishing rights, before all other newspapers in the world. Remember, this was a huge news event uh, right after the discovery. But the London Times, they were able to publish the first photos. And we were there looking through this uh, wonderful collection of photographs that I'd never seen before. And I mentioned the curse, or someone did in the room, and then I got the full story. Turns out there was nothing called a curse. There was, no, I mean, you know, we, we know that certain shaptis have curses put on them and things like that in ancient Egyptian history, but this curse of King Tut really came about from a rival newspaper in London that needed its own headlines. So it started this idea of a curse. So I've, I've seen no, uh, no evidence of a curse, except I know when we're set, before the artifacts get here and somebody hits their, uh, their thumb with a hammer when they're putting up the, the scenery, we'll blame the curse of King Tut. <laughs> well, my last question for you, yeah. and it's kind of a gimme, I guess. All I right. feel like it asked by everyone. What is your favorite item in the exhibition and why? Never been at, yes, I've heard that before. <laughs> um, you know, I, the, the, the easy answer, and it's true, but I'll, I'll give you an answer, is, you know, every day there's a, a new favorite. You discover something that you go, wow, I've never really seen it that way before. Um, it's got to be the little game uh, that uh, uh, it's called Senate. You, you flip it over, there's another game. The workmanship, the, the craftsmanship, this little drawer that slides in and out, that's fantastic. But what it does more than anything, I think, is humanize uh, this this kind of uh, very famous, revered person in history. But you look at that game, you go, yeah, he was a little boy, you know? And he was probably down on the on the shores of the, uh, the banks of the Nile, and uh, probably friends did not necessarily take a, a great deal of uh, uh, pride in beating the king. You wouldn't want to do that at the game. But, uh, you know, when I look at that game, I, I get it. Yeah, this was uh, when he became king, just a nine-year-old boy. So it's those personal items, whether it's the bed or the chair or, or some of the things he used in everyday life that I think are my favorite. You know, it's been such a privilege uh, to bring this exhibition around the world. We go to one more city after Houston, Seattle, and then most likely, as I mentioned, right. they return to Egypt. So uh, I, weeks ago, you know, it's been in the planning for years, but uh, the, the installation started about six weeks ago, I guess, and the people here at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston have been so delightful. Uh, I think King Tut would be quite proud of where these objects are on display. I certainly am and very delighted to work with everybody here. Oh great, thank you. You're welcome.